this uh, moment in history provides an unprecedented opportunity for Christian entrepreneurship. Um, and, and what we've seen happen in the broader culture is that there's a growing interest, uh, there's more access to entrepreneurship than there's ever been before. Um, entrepreneurship has grown in its influence and in ultimately the impact that it has in shaping the institutions that shape the culture and shape the narrative uh, of society. So, um, and, and Scott mentioned this, but the Kauffman Foundation did this study, and we talk about this a lot. Uh, this study was done in 2012, and 54% of millennials want to start, have started, or want to be a part of starting something. Um, and so this is, this is kind of, yeah, millennial, that whole thing. But actually this represents a vocational shift, right? So I don't just want to be a doctor, lawyer, or teacher. I want to be a doctor that starts my own practice, a lawyer that starts my own practice. I want to go into education and teach for five years and then start a charter school, right? I want to be the boss, right? I want to shape things because millennials, and this is a really neat thing, millennials see things that they don't like and they want to push back. And hey, for us as Christians, right, this sounds familiar, right? In our theological position of the already but not yet, we see something that ought to be different in the culture. And what I love about the millennial generation is they want to push back on that, and they don't mind saying it, right? And it's actually not unlike other generations that have gone before when they're in this age, right? You know, we had protests and we didn't like things, and this is, that, this is the time in their life. It's just the millennials are getting a lot of other narratives thrown on top of that because of the situation. Um, our friend Will Hoey was um, uh, working at Goldman Sachs, and he was um, about to be promoted into this new position. And meanwhile, he and his brother had gone to Honduras and seen sort of the, you know, the brokenness there that existed and all kinds of problems in the society. And they realized that there were people there that wanted to work. They just didn't have access to jobs. And so Will and his brother actually were going to leave their companies. Will was at Goldman Sachs and uh, Chris was at Boston Consulting Group. Um, both obviously really powerhouse, prominent institutions. And he went to his boss and told him he was going to quit. And his boss is like, what are you going to do? Like, how could you leave Goldman Sachs to go be an entrepreneur? Like, and he asked Will, he goes, well, what is, what is entrepreneurship anyway? And, and Will said this. He said that, you know, entrepreneurs see a better future and then they proceed to create it. And I think what's beautiful about this is, you know, Will was a young 20-something at that time, and that's just sort of what came out of his mouth. Uh, he, a Christ follower. But what's cool about this is I actually think that this is a theological position that we could all agree with, right? Is that we as Christians see a better future possible. And when, when we talk about cultural engagement, cultural engagement is our opportunity to step into the brokenness of what is and try to help redefine what could be or what ought to be, right? And entrepreneurship is a vehicle for us to create new things that create new narratives, right? That show people a different way. Um, and that's what I love about this. So it's not only this vocational shift, but the millennials are able to engage in this way because they see more, they see the brokenness of the institutions. They see the brokenness of the American dream, right? And we're, we're seeing this narrative heavy in the political season that we're in, right? Um, and so they want to create things that are different. What's also neat um, when we think about culture um, is, is um, thing, things have changed technologically, right? So I grew up playing this game and I thought it was the coolest thing ever, right? But this game was uh, on a computer that, you know, was founded by a couple of Steves in a garage in Silicon Valley, right? For them to be entrepreneurs at that time took a lot of money, right? Took a lot of R&D um, and they were sort of seen as crazy people, right? Um, the, it wasn't that cool to do, uh, but they decided to go out there and do it. They started, you know, Apple Computer and they created the first computer. But since then, um, in part because of Kip Diamond, Dynamite and his love for technology, technology has accelerated like crazy, right? So much so that in, in technology, the acceleration of technology and the acceleration, um, it has accelerated access to entrepreneurship. So we could stop this seminar right now and we could each start our own business and launch it on Kickstarter or Etsy right now in this room using just the tools that we have here, right? That's unprecedented. There's never been an opportunity like this where it's been so easy to create new things. So of course millennials want to start new things. Um, so that's kind of the access, look, thinking about access of entrepreneurship. 
Next is um, the actual sort of influence that entrepreneurship has. And it's sort of all over culture, whether it's Muhammad Yunus winning the Nobel Peace Prize for um, you know, the, the work with uh, microfinance to alleviate global poverty, uh, Kony 2012, the, the people that started Invisible Children, what they did was they proposed an entrepreneurial solution to shed light on a major injustice happening in the world with Joseph Kony. Uh, Shark Tank, of course, the most popular shows on TV right now. And then this is one that we use a lot. Um, uh, the final one on the right there, that's Dennis and Naveen. They're the founders of an app called Foursquare. Um, and that's a Gap campaign ad where they're pictured alongside rock stars and movie stars. So entrepreneurs in some way are these new sort of cultural heroes, right? It's no longer you're weird if you're an entrepreneur. It's cool to be an entrepreneur. You're a rock star and a movie star and an entrepreneur. Um, and with that, I think, comes responsibility. Right? So entrepreneurs have to be really thoughtful, um, or, or they don't have to be, but um, my, my proposal is that they, they ought to be really thoughtful about what they actually create. Um, because there's so much power uh, in the influence that they can have, um, they actually have a choice to be responsible for what they make or to just sort of have one objective, and it's their own objective and it doesn't really matter what they create and what the impact is on the culture. So there's another narrative, right, of course, that uh, just to go down this responsibility path, of course, you know, I live in New York City and Times Square is this place that just screams at you, right? And we have heard the statistic that we see on average 5,000 ads a day, um, which is kind of crazy. And the question is, what are those ads saying? And what's interesting about ads today is because we know so much about the human psyche, the ads are no longer just trying to sell a product, right? They're selling, per Jamie's talk this morning, they are selling a vision of the good life. Right? And they're not just selling that vision of the good life. They're actually speaking into what it means to be human. They're actually sending messages to us about what it means to be human and what we should do. Right? So the New Yorker, which I think has some of the most on-point cultural commentary out there with their cartoons nonetheless. Um, at this, I saw this in a New Yorker just a few months back. Um, and it's so true, right? It's funny, but it's funny in the way that it's very true. Um, and what, so sometimes what we want to do now is let's blame the evil people on Madison Avenue and the ad industry, right? Let's blame them. Uh-uh. Source material, right? What's the source? The source is the entrepreneurs, right? The source is the entrepreneurs that are creating these companies. Advertising is a downstream thing that's sending out messages about what it means to be human and what you should buy and the vision of good life that you should buy into. And if you buy this product, then you'll have this vision of the good life, right? It's a downstream thing. So as much as we ought to, as Christians, care about entrepreneurship, absolutely, or about advertising and the messages, absolutely. But I'm saying, we, let's even go upstream a little bit more to entrepreneurship. What are the actual products that we're making that are perpetuating these messages, right? And are those products actually good for the world? So. Um, another one, just to illustrate this point, um, uh, thinking about this generation, and um, uh, in October 2010, that's when uh, this company was founded, and uh, millennials in the audience are always like, yeah, they know this one pretty well, but it's Instagram, and Instagram's a photo sharing uh, service, and what's interesting about this is that on April 2012, um, just to think about this, on April 2012, um, Facebook acquired Instagram for a billion dollars. At the time, um, Instagram was 18 months old. They had 13 employees. They had zero dollars in revenue. And Facebook thought that they were, they had, but they had millions of users, right? They had millions of users. So Facebook thought they were worth a billion dollars and they proposed to buy them and Instagram said, sure, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sure. We will allow you to do that. Um, but what's interesting is on this same date, this company, Kodak, which was founded in the 1800s, in 1888, um, was, had literally thousands of employees and was worth zero, right? They had declared bankruptcy a few months earlier and they were going through bankruptcy court and figuring out how to do pensions and all that with employees. Um, they're sort of still in existence today. But um, so, so entrepreneurship also, it, the scalability through technology, the opportunity there, um, and how entrepreneurship is disrupting the major institutions. Um, those major institutions being companies as well as 
uh, political structures and educational. I mean, it's sort of perpetuating all areas of culture and it's disrupting. And part of its ability to do that is how quickly we can scale things. Um, there's a whole changing landscape here. Jack Dorsey kind of summed this up and he uh, did an interview with Forbes magazine. I think he was on the cover of Forbes and this is where the quote came from. But he said that the most efficient means to spread an idea today is a corporate structure. 200 years ago, it was something different. 100 years from now, it will be something completely different. So he's saying that not only um, do we have an opportunity to create new things, but those new things are going to send messages, right? And through the advertising and through the product that we create, we could actually go do a whole case study right now on that whole, the medium is the message quote from back, I think it was 1964, um, when that quote came out, the medium is the message and what the message is that the medium of Instagram and Twitter and Snapchat send. Um, that's a whole other case study, but we can't go there. Um, so. Anyway, but that, that's this. I think this is challenging for us as Christians because at one point I would actually propose that the church, we, we could say, was the most efficient means to spread an idea. If we wanted to spread an idea, we'd do it through, through church. I think at one point it was probably government. Another point in culture, it was probably through the education system. Um, but those things have sort of all been upended and disrupted in a sense, and there's a lot of distrust in those major institutions. Um, so this is just kind of a, a little chart when we think about it. Um, starting with entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs shape ultimately the organization and what the, you know, what we're going to create, what we're going to build, what messages we're sending, and then that shapes stakeholders and industries and ultimately the best practices of industry shape culture. Um, I think when looking at this, just to demonstrate it, a point, I think uh, Apple is a good example when you think about Apple launching the original iPhone now, of course, they shape the best practices of the industry and that has massively shaped the culture. So we think like who an entrepreneur is actually determines their motive, why they do it, and then the vision, what they actually do. Um, and then of course the execution of that, which ends up being the how of what they end up actually creating. Um, so just a couple of uh, examples in our culture. Top one is Jeff Skoll, participant media. Uh, Skoll was one of the original founders of eBay. Uh, when he made his millions selling eBay, he went on to found participant they're behind like uh, Waiting for Superman or Food Inc, An Inconvenient Truth. But Skoll actually green lights every project that comes across. And this article that Fortune wrote about him actually says that they tend to reflect his progressive and ultimately optimistic worldview. He's sending messages through that and he has the ability to do that because of the money he made as an entrepreneur. Um, Wendy Kopp from Teach for America, um, this article is just talking about the founding of it and how her conscience was compelled to imagine a new solution for the broken education system that she saw when she's studying to become a teacher. Um, and then the bottom one is Dov Charney. He's the founder of American Apparel. Um, Dov was actually recently ousted, but this was a quote that we pulled from their own press website. Um, Much of American Apparel's success in projecting an image of cool um, must be attributed to a branding image originating with Charney's wild, wacky, hypersexual persona and extending out to the highly targeted advertisements. Um, he doesn't believe in marriage or monogamy and isn't ashamed to acknowledge consensual sexual relationships with employees of his company. Um, and if anybody's ever seen an American Apparel ad um, or walked by one of their stores, you see what this image of cool is, what their version of it is, and, or you've seen one of their ads on the internet. Um, and of course it's influential because they have massive scale. They've got stores in every major um, market in the country and, uh, lots of dollars spent in online advertising. So these things uh, represent the entrepreneur's value. And this sort of leads us, all these different things, the interest and the access, the influence and the impact that can be had through entrepreneurship, it kind of leads us to this statement, which is that the future of culture, uh, we think depends largely on the worldview of the next generation of entrepreneurs. What's their vision? What are they gonna decide to create? Um, and this is a place where, um, of course, there's a huge infrastructure now that's propped up to help these entrepreneurs create their visions, accelerators and investing groups and all of that. Um, but what we've seen is that faith has actually been left out of the equation. It's not only been left out, but it's like for people that are even in the social, like the social good sphere, social entrepreneurship, um, people are actually, we've had entrepreneurs tell us they were told literally to leave their faith off their application. Like don't put it on your application to our accelerator or if you're gonna come in and pitch us to get capital, don't even talk about it. Even the ones that are working on things like global poverty, right? Um, which are very, you know, obviously faith influenced. So, um, so that's kind of the work that we do. We, we at Praxis actually want to flip this on its head. And, and we, we believe, of course, that the gospel 
uh, is a transforming vision and, and it literally sits at the center of who we are as humans. It reshapes and redefines who we are as humans and then it reshapes how we view the culture at large. Um, and those two things actually inform what we should do as entrepreneurs. So this is kind of the Venn diagram that, that demonstrates that. Our theology changes everything and therefore we look at the culture and specifically the brokenness in the culture and ways that we could engage in the culture different. And then we think about how we can use our entrepreneurial resources, our intellect, our networks of capital and talent, and actually deploy them in service of things that sort of sit at the center of this, things that are close to God's heart. Um, and so um, you might kind of now think, well, what does that look like? Because most of the Christian businesses I've ever interacted with are really cheesy and really bad, and I would never buy anything from them. Um, and you're right. Um, there, there literally needs to be a whole new imagination for this kind of stuff. And, and we need to be able to redefine what it means to be a thoughtful, um, to have like thoughtful engagement with the culture as a Christian in business, right? Or a Christian nonprofit. Um, in, in other words, it's not an arms race to see who can uh, come up with the most creative way to put a fish on their website or on their business card, right? Um, it is not that. That's a generation that did a lot of sort of copying the culture and then slapping Christianity on it. Um, what we're proposing is that the gospel actually changes everything, so it changes how we look at it. Let's not just copy culture and then slap a Christian label on it. Let's actually reimagine culture. And in fact, I think that that's what we're sort of called to do because we have our eyes set on a different kingdom, right? With different values. Um, and so um, we're, that's the work that we're doing. We're trying to figure that out. And I'm just gonna share a couple of examples to kind of make this a little bit more real. Um, but this is Jason Ballard. Uh, he was, um, uh, he's the founder of a venture called Treehouse based in Austin, Texas. And Ballard's also um, another really influential uh, venture based out of Austin is Whole Foods. So what's interesting about Whole Foods is John Mackey's vision uh, didn't just transform the grocery industry, but it transformed the agriculture industry as well, right? Like literally like organic is everywhere. Like I think 7-Eleven now sells organic taquitos. Like it's it, like, right? The perpetuation or, of organic is everywhere. And so um, um, in other words, their vision and what they started with Whole Foods actually downstream did a, a ton of disruption, right? And they actually realized, Jason realized that the home, and that Jason was about to go to seminary and caught this vision and somebody said, don't go to seminary, go start a business. Um, and he took his theological convictions about the earth and what we were doing to destroy the earth and in particular found that the American home, actually more so than SUVs, right? The big fight against SUVs has been like, they're the bad evil ones that's destroying the earth. It's actually the American home is the most inefficient and has like the biggest carbon footprint. But then he thought, well, you, how do you change homes? Well, you change homes by thinking about how homes are built, right? And then home improvement stores, right? So they actually started a home improvement store that focuses on renewable energy and all this stuff with a theological conviction that we should create homes that contribute to, you know, the flourishing of the earth instead of the destruction of it. Um, so. There's no you know, fish somewhere hidden in the store, um, but these are Jason's theological convictions working themselves out in a winsome way to the culture where people go in the store and they're like, wow, this place is really different. It's really neat. You know? um, so that's Jason and, and he's got a bigger vision for the world. Whether it'll work out, we don't know, right? <laughs> but he's at least thinking really imaginatively about trying to do that. Um, they, their first store in Austin uh, is, they're actually just raised a round of capital to go to start their next two stores, so they're on their way. Uh, scaling retail is really hard and it's really capital intensive. Um, this is Chris and Will Hoey. I mentioned these guys to you earlier. Um, but one thing about their company that they started was again, they wanted to create jobs for people. And so um, their fundamental thing was not, let's go into Honduras and find you know, a way to extract the natural resources. What they actually did is they, they went in and tr tried to say, how can we use the resources that are going to serve these people um, in a way that's going to create the most jobs? And so they actually, they found this indigenous wood and all they were going to do is start a, a wood exporting business because there's other countries in the world that want to buy this wood. And what they realized is that if they found a way to manufacture it, um, and sell the pr a product that was produced from the wood could actually, it was something like 30x, the kind of return that they could get instead of just bare bones, shipping out the bare bones product to somebody else. So they, they ended up starting a toy company. They never set out to start a toy company, but they did set out to have an impact on people 
Um, and in the process, they realized the best way to do that was to start a toy company. So it's these wooden toy blocks that have magnets in them and they're really imaginative and it's really neat. Um, and uh, they're running in Honduras and they're sold in stores all over the country. Um, there's a little store in my neighborhood that I just walked into the other day and Tegu blocks were in there. I was like, that's so cool. I still sort of don't think this stuff is real all the time. Um, so uh, this Joe Baker, uh, Joe has had a conviction about um, the pro-life movement and specifically how Christians have engaged in pro-life. Um, and he just was like, it really broke his heart how Christians have been seen uh, on this really important cultural issue, right? And he thought, what's a different way for us to engage? And uh, what they ended up doing is creating a mobile um, ultrasound unit that they can uh, drive to places, like places in particular where they don't have access to ultrasound, because he found that something like 80 plus percent of post-abortive women never actually saw an ultrasound to see what was growing inside of them. Um, and so then they felt like they didn't necessarily have a very unbiased good choice because they never actually saw the thing. And so they said, what if we you know, create this thing where we could bring a, an ultrasound and offer it to free, for free to people? So they did that, and it's a beautiful product. It's a Mercedes Sprinter van that's completely transformed the inside. Nice leather, it's really welcoming and inviting. Um, and they'll go park it in places where there are people who are considering having abortions. Sometimes that's across the street from a pregnancy clinic. Um, sometimes that's you know, at a big concert or festival um, where there's a lot of young people. And they're sort of spreading this message. And again, save the storks, right? So they, their branding will say something like, did you know that there's been 54 million storks that have been shot down in the United States since 1973? And people go, what? Who's shooting the storks? <laughs> it's like, it takes them a second, and then they're like, wait, storks, babies, oh, oh, abortion, yep, yeah, oh, oh, got it. But it's, a really, it's winsome, right? It's a really winsome way to engage. And they actually, he's got a great, great story um, that they're, they're, I mean, in some ways, they're trying to put, I mean, they're not trying, they're trying to give people access to this thing. In the process of doing that, they've actually put a few abortion clinics out of business. Um, and what's, but what's neat about that, so sometimes they're like, oh, we put them out of business. But they actually like had a doctor that came over and like is totally like enamored with what they do. Cause he's like, yeah, these women need that, you know? And they can't pay for it somewhere else. So like an abortion doctor. And he literally decided to shut down his clinic and he's like on their side of the issue now. Um, and it's so neat to see because I think that previous efforts uh, that Christians were making in the sphere weren't working very well, right? And didn't give us the kind of image, kind of what John Seal talked about last night. So again, neat, innovative uh, solution to something. Um, and Joe is like an incredible entrepreneur. Like he is so creative. He could be doing a million different things with his entrepreneurial resources, but he's, he's spending them on this and it's a nonprofit. So Really neat. Um, the final one is uh, uh, Ben and Laura Harrison. They've kind of had one of the, the really hard stories of parents, which is being told um, after your first kid is born that there's a problem. And uh, their problem was Jonas was effectively blind in one of his eyes. And uh, they didn't know exactly what was wrong and they couldn't figure it out. They said he had to go to surgery and one surgery led to the next, to the next over the last number of months. And Jonas has just turned three and he's had over 25 surgeries. Um, on his eye and they still can't figure it out. So Jonas has to wear glasses, which made them uh, obviously like they're like, oh, this is, you know, they have dreams for their kid and he's just not able to sort of live them out and breaks their hearts. But they realize that there's a lot of parents that go through this. Their suffering kind of connected them to this thing and they, uh, being designers that had fashionable eyewear, they decided to create fashionable eyewear for kids um, to make them less self-conscious about, you know, the whole four eyes thing and all that. Um, and it's just neat. I mean, the branding's well done and all that. And they do like a, you know, buy one, give one, uh, similar to like a Warby Parker. Um, but the story resonates with people um, and it's, it's neat. So those are just a few of the ventures, nonprofits and businesses that are, we're kind of seeing people actually figure out how to live this out. Like starting with our theology, how do we look at brokenness in the culture different and then deploy entrepreneurial solutions um, that hopefully maybe push back and it might not be big. Um, it might just be really small, but there's an opportunity to do it. So um, that's kind of the, the cool work that I get to be a part of, and um, it's a lot of fun. And, um, but one thing real quick that we looked at is like a historical model of this, and uh, it's Clapham Circle. Do you guys know, how many people here know about Clapham? Okay, so there's a little bit of resonance with it. I know there's certain circles that are like really know Clapham and really passionate about it, but 
William Wilberforce is kind of the most famous member, um, but sometimes what people don't know about Clapham is their, their 40 plus year um, mission to abolish the British slave trade um, actually included launching over 65 different ventures. And there were ventures in all parts of culture. So Wilberforce of course served in the government, but there were people that were launching nonprofits. There were educators that were doing things in the education realm. There were writers and literary people that were launching publications and things like that. They realized that this slave issue, they needed to have people in all parts of culture working on this together. Um, Tompkins was their biography, and he said this, that the ethos of Clapham, uh, it, it didn't just abolish the slave trade, but it literally became the spirit of the age. So it reshaped the entire sort of the zeitgeist of that generation. Um, and, and so we're kind of like, well, well, what might this look like for us, right? Thoughtfully engaging in this way. Um, and there's just a couple of uh, neat learnings that we pulled from Clapham um, to, to kind of help us think about this. But um, basically, the people seeking first the kingdom is essential. Knowing, um, this is one of the things, knowing that the work, even though it's really good work, well worth doing, it might not actually work. Uh, they spent 40 years and they had so many stops and starts, right, of like the bill's about to be passed and then something happened and then, the, you know, the rug got pulled from under them. Um, and so that, uh, and needing that community-based approach elevates impact. I mean, we know, and Christian Union talks about this so much, um, the importance of community, uh, people to share the burden with, because this is hard work um, and, uh, and, and you're going to be criticized and uh, critiqued by the culture. So you need a community to walk with you. Uh, Cross-sector work, as I mentioned, is, is critical. We need people in all areas of culture thinking about this, all industries and sectors, um, uh, to be able to shape the zeitgeist. Uh, the leverage of generous and organized talent, capital, and influence is, is key. So sometimes college students are like, well, I don't have the whatever. Well, you've got intellectual ca capacity and capital to deploy. You know, you're sort of the talent that can go. And then uh, they had, I think the most successful banker of the time, uh, Henry Thornton, was the main financier of the work at Clapham. And so even though he was in an industry and he was successful, he was deploying that capital in service of these other projects um, and, uh, and influence. So people like Wilberforce and William Penn were in uh, the parliament and working on it. Um, so lasting change, finally, um, as, uh, as Nietzsche would have said, uh, is that it requires a long obedience in the same direction. Um, Wilberforce basically spent his life on this um, and passed away, I think, around two weeks after the, the bill was passed. Um, and so when we think about, and, and uh, my challenge, anytime I, I speak to people, is wh what are we spending our, um, our capital, right? Whether it be intellectual capital, um, physical capital, what are we, what are we spending it on? Uh, and are, are there ways that we can engage in work like this um, that kind of sits in as close to God's heart? Um, so we, we sort of say that there's an opportunity at this moment in history for uh, entrepreneurs to be winsome cultural witnesses and their ventures can be a modern apologetic uh, because people don't necessarily want to hear about your faith, but they want to see it. And because entrepreneurs have control over the motive and the intent and the ultimate product, they, more than a lot of other people, have an opportunity to be that cultural witness to show to be a full to put their full expression of what their faith means on display whereas other institutions and I'm not this isn't like a everybody should go be an entrepreneur talk um, there's certain people that are going to be called to be in those institutions that's what Clapham was that, that's my point in talking about Clapham um, but those people in a lot of ways are limited and constrained of how much they can say right and they don't always have control over the product that they're they're being paid to make, right? Or the advertisement that they're being paid to put out there. Um, but an entrepreneur does, and with that comes responsibility. So we think that's really important that Christians engage in this way. Um, so that's the work that we, we get to do in kind of the, the broader why that we do it. And so in the way that we do it, we, we run a couple of startup accelerators for people that are in the market. I shared, you know, four examples. There are people that have been through our accelerator program. Um, and it's, a, it's basically coming alongside them with world-class Christian mentors. Um, access to capital, we think values-aligned capital is really important, uh, that they're getting capital infused from people that have the same values from them, um, because of course capital can change the direction of a company really rapidly. Um, and uh, discipleship and then having a global community. So we do that, um, have a bunch of wonderful mentors there, uh, have values-aligned capital on both the for-profit and non-profit side. 
And yeah, these are the portfolio of, of ventures that we're just extraordinarily proud of. Um, and these are the entrepreneurs doing the really wonderful work out there. Literally all around the world, nonprofit social enterprises thinking about uh, what is the redemptive edge of technology? What is the redemptive edge of orphan care, freedom, genomics, fashion, um, all those kind of different industries. So that's fun. And then I think what we realized in the first few years of doing this is that um, so much of how they think about what they make, like in other words, like it was sort of too late. We were getting them downstream because we were working with companies that were already in existence. And many of them had already made a bunch of these decisions about what they made and who sits on their board and who's, who's their co-founder. Um, and they were like, whoa, I never thought about these things before because nobody at my home church told me to think about it in this way. <laughs> um, and so we realized that we need to translate these lessons from our entrepreneurs in the market to the next generation. And that's where we started the Praxis Academy. And that is our undergraduate program. Um, and pulled together uh, some of the most thoughtful Christian students from all over the country, uh, from some of the best institutions, both in the Christian uh, sec schools as well as the secular schools. And it's awesome to see the intersection of those minds come together. Uh, and we think they may not have otherwise met. And our hope is that they actually decide to start things together. Um, they may not start things together right away, um, but they'll hopefully stay in touch and build relationships that um, allow them to do it. And, just have wonderful people telling their stories and speaking into them, showing an alternative version of what it might mean to be an entrepreneur um, in the world. So we think that if we, if we can do this for 30 years, we'll serve a, a thousand entrepreneurs and get to translate this to 100,000 college students. And that's kind of why we do it. Um, uh, but James Davidson Hunter really summed this up really well in his book, To Change the World. And he said, the key actor in history is not the individual genius, but rather the network and the new institutions that are created out of those networks. So as we talked about entrepreneurship's ability to disrupt these major institutions that are out there today, uh, that we have an opportunity as Christians to actually form communities that are thinking really thoughtfully about these new institutions that are created in the context of community, and then how do we do it together? Because the myth of the solo entrepreneur, the entrepreneur is the rock star hero, I mean, that's a total myth, right? Um, and even though Wilberforce is the one that, you know, gets most of the credit for that, I mean, there was so much other work that went on uh, that, that we have to give credit to that entire network of people that was known as Clapham. So that's, um, that's kind of our, what we, what we care about and thinking that if we have, um, if we can kind of build a network that has a, a focus on prayer and people process and perseverance that um, we, we too, like Clapham, can proclaim Christ in culture through entrepreneurship. And, and maybe, if God wills, we could be a part of renewing the spirit of the age. Mm -hmm. um, uh, if, if that's what God wills for this moment in history, we think that there's an opportunity there. And, and we have reason to believe that he cares about this. Um, and he cares about these areas of culture that are being disrupted. Um, and, uh, and perhaps he wants to reshape the narrative and, and maybe we can be a small part of that in some way. So um, that's kind of my thoughts on entrepreneurship in this moment. And, how we think it's sort of this new blank canvas for us to create new things and propose new ideas to the world through it.